Hi there. In lesson 18, Candace and I will start with talking about all things quadratic, kind of finishing up what we'll be doing with quadratics. In the last part of the lesson, Steve's going to introduce us to the last new idea in Math 65, which is the idea of a function. I'm going to start by looking at applications of quadratic equations that involve maxima and minima. So here's the first application. A manufacturer determines that the marginal cost, which is measured in dollars per unit, for producing X specialty waffle irons is given by this formula. We're going to use the formula to answer a couple of questions. Here's the first question. We're asked to evaluate the marginal cost when X equals 5 and state the practical significance of the result. So let's first start with the number crunching. So if x equals 5, then the marginal cost is 0 0.03 times 5 squared minus 1.2 times 5 plus 13. Let's get a value for that. So 0 0.03 times 5 squared minus 1.2 times 5 plus 13 that equals 775. Now we've got to think about the practical significance. Well, how can we discuss practical significance with really not, without knowing what marginal cost is? So I'm going to give you a definition of marginal cost, which will help us interpret this result a little bit better. So marginal cost describes the cost of producing just one additional unit in this case, one more waffle iron, when x units have been produced. This is an idea that's often used in economics, figuring out the economics of production. So to state the practical significance, we just found that when x equals 5, the marginal cost is $7.75 per unit. So this tells us that when 5 waffle irons have been produced, it will cost an additional $7.75 per unit to produce one more waffle iron. Here's another question. Now we're being asked to find the vertex of the graph of this model and state the practical significance of this point. So let's start by sort of crunching out the coordinates of the vertex. So the first coordinate will be x, the number of waffle irons, and the second coordinate will be the marginal cost. So the first coordinate we can find by evaluating negative b over 2a for the values of a and b in this formula. Well, in this case, b is negative 1.2 and a is 0 0.03. So this is the opposite of negative 1.2 over 2 times 0 0.03. And this is going to be 1.2 over 0 0.06. And this turns out to be 20. So let's evaluate the marginal cost when x equals 20. So when x equals 20, the marginal cost, I can evaluate just using my formula. That's how I find the second coordinate of the vertex. So let's calculate this. So we have 0 0.03 times 20 squared minus 1.2 times 20 plus 13, and that's 1. So the coordinates of the vertex are 20 and 1. So let's think a little bit about this. We found that when five waffle irons were produced, it cost $7.75 to produce just one more. What the vertex is telling us is that when 20 waffle irons are produced, it costs just $1 to produce an additional waffle iron. One is a lot smaller than $7.75 per unit. 
So let's think about the vertex of this particular parabola. In this case, our value of a is 0 0.03, which is positive. So the graph of this parabola will open up. The vertex will give us a minimum value. So this is the smallest marginal cost given to us by this model. So let's write down that conclusion. So the vertex tells us that when 20 waffle irons are produced, the marginal cost is at a minimum of one dollar per unit. So the vertex is giving us information about a minimum value. So let's kind of summarize some of this. When we're thinking about the practical significance of the vertex of some quadratic model, when A is positive, the second coordinate of the vertex yields a minimum value of the dependent variable. That's because we have a parabola that opens up. When A is negative, the second coordinate of the vertex will yield a maximum value because in this case, the parabola will open down. So let's use this information to talk about another optimization problem. On a balmy February day in Portland, Kyle and Melissa take a break from studying algebra to sell lemonade to passers-by. Unable to keep their minds off all things quadratic, they determine the revenue, measured in dollars, from the sale of n glasses of lemonade is given by this formula. Now this is a quadratic formula. We see the leading coefficient is negative, so the graph of this model will be a parabola that will open down. What type of questions can we ask? Well, basically, how many glasses of lemonade should Kyle and Melissa sell to maximize their revenue? Certainly something they probably would like to do. So in order to do this, we're going to start by finding the vertex, because that's going to give us the information we need. So the vertex in this case will have first coordinate n, number of glasses of lemonade sold, second coordinate r for the revenue. So n is going to be given by the opposite of b over 2a, which is going to be the opposite of 0 0.80 over 2 times negative 0 0.01, which is going to be a positive number. We're going to have 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.02. And let's see, 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.02, that should be 40. So let's calculate the corresponding revenue. When n equals 40, then the revenue is going to be point, negative 0 0.01 times 40 squared plus 0 0.80 times 40. Let's calculate this. So 0 0.01, make it negative, times 40 squared plus 0.8 times 40. That's 16. So this is the revenue. This is the amount of money they're bringing in. So to answer the question, when Kyle and Melissa sell 40 glasses of lemonade, Their revenue is a maximum of $16. Here's another example. Steve's neighbors are building a rectangular pen for the ferrets they keep in their yard. They have salvaged 48 feet of wire fencing for this project. What is the largest area that can be enclosed by the 48 feet of fencing, and what are the dimensions of this particular ferret pen? So what we need to do here at the beginning is find a model for the area of the ferret pen. 
So ultimately we want to know the dimensions. So we're going to want to know the length and width of this ferret pen. So let's start by defining a couple of variables. So I'm going to let x and y represent the length and width in feet, respectively, of the ferret pen. And I'm going to use this to kind of sketch a picture. So x is the length, and y is going to be the width. So now we want to come up with a model for the area. Well, we know that the area of a rectangle is its length times its width. But our goal is to maximize the area. What we know is that when we find the vertex of a quadratic model, we'll be able to find a maximum. So we need to work a little bit more here to get a quadratic model. Well, we're also given another bit of information, that the neighbors have salvaged 48 feet of fencing for this project. So we know that the distance around this pen is going to be 48 feet. So if I take 2x plus 2y, that's got to equal the 48 feet of fencing that are available for the project. Now what I can do is simplify a little bit here. And I think I'm going to solve for y in terms of x. So y equals 24 minus x. So why am I doing this? Well now when I come write down a model for the area, I have the area equals the length times the width. So we have a model for the area of this ferret pen. Now let's think a little bit about this. I'm going to rewrite this as 24x minus x squared, and this highlights that I have a parabola that opens down. But when I was creating my model, I have it in factored form. If I thought about making a rough sketch of this graph to find the x-intercepts, I would solve the equation 0 equals x times 24 minus x. The x-intercepts are 0, 0 and 24, 0. Now what we need here to figure out the maximum area is we need the vertex. And the vertex is going to occur halfway between the x-intercepts. It should occur at x equals 12. And if I do a calculation, if I use my formula, the opposite of b over 2a, negative 24 divided by negative 2 is indeed 12. So I know the x-coordinate of the vertex. So in order to find the maximum area, I want to find the vertex. So the vertex is going to occur at 12. And when x equals 12, what's the area? Well, it's going to be 12 times 12, which is 144 square feet. So I know that the maximum area will occur when the length is 12 feet, and it will give us a maximum area of 144 feet. So use the model to determine the maximum area. Well, we just did that on the previous screen. We figured out that it would be 144 square feet. So the maximum area enclosed by 48 feet of fencing will be 144 square feet. So let's determine the dimensions of the ferret pen that enclose this maximum area. Well, what does the picture look like? We said um, x is 12, y is 24 minus x, so when x equals 12, y is 12 as well. So now we know that our ferret pen is actually going to be a 12 foot by 12 foot square. So the dimensions of this particular ferret pen that are going to include the maximum area are 12 by 12.
Now with these types of problems, this is a common feature. We had a fixed perimeter. We had a fixed amount of fencing. And it turned out that the maximum area was enclosed by a square. So here's our final example. The bending moment, m, of a beam supported at one end at a distance x from the support is given by this rather complicated formula. So before we dive too deeply into this, here's a rough picture of the beam. It's being supported here on the right end, and we're measuring this bending moment, a concept from physics, at this distance x from where the beam is being supported. Here's the formula. There's lots of letters. The independent variable's x, the distance from the end of the beam, m is the dependent variable, but we have these letters w and l. The two, they're constants. l is the length of the whole beam. That's a constant in the problem. And w is something called the uniform load per unit length. And w is going to be a positive constant for us. So here's the question we're going to answer. We want to find the value of x that maximizes the bending moment. We need to find the x coordinate of the vertex. So what makes this problem hard is we don't see any numbers. We've got lots of letters and no numbers, except for those factors of 1 half. So in order to find the x coordinate of the vertex, we're going to do what we have been doing all along. X is going to be the opposite of b over 2a. But we really need to think a little bit about what a and b are. So the first thing I want to point out here is that my formula for the bending moment has the linear term first and the second degree term second. I'm going to rearrange that a little bit just so I'm putting it in a more traditional form so we can see everything for what it is. So now remember that a is the coefficient of the square term and b is the coefficient of the linear term. In this case, our coefficients involve constants given as letters. So to calculate the x-coordinate of the vertex, I'm going to take the opposite of b. So that's 1 half wl over 2 times a. a is negative 1 half w. That's it. So now, one of the things I notice is I have two negatives here, so everything's going to be positive. I'm going to leave the numerator alone. In the denominator, I just have w. Notice I have a factor of w in both the numerator and denominator, and this simplifies to 1 half l. So we found that when we're at a distance that's 1 half the length of this beam, that the bending moment is maximized. That's what we were asked to find, so let's state a conclusion. So when um, the distance from the supported end of the beam is one half the length of the entire beam, the bending moment is at a maximum. So to summarize briefly what we've done in this lesson, we've discovered that the vertex gives us practical information about where our model achieves either a minimum value or a maximum value. Now I'm going to turn it over to Candace, who's going to do a bunch of different types of questions about quadratics. Hi. As Anne promised, I'm going to do all kinds of different applications of quadratic equations. I'm going to start by solving s equals 1 half gt squared for t. Sometimes it's nice to know what the formula you're working with represents. 
In this case, s is the distance a dropped object has fallen t seconds after it was dropped. This is a free fall model. We're asked to solve this equation for t. So the first thing I'm going to do is isolate t squared. And my first step in isolating t squared is going to be to clear the fractions from this equation. So I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 2. That gives me 2s equals g t squared. To isolate t squared now, I need to get rid of that g. It's being multiplied, so I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by g. So 2s divided by g equals t squared. Now I can use the square root principle. The square root principle tells me that t is going to equal plus or minus the square root of 2s divided by g. Now if we're actually working an application with this model, I would only choose the positive square root since t is representing a time. In this case, all we were asked to do was solve for t. We've done that. Now let's solve v equals 1 third pi r squared h for r. Again, let's see what this model's representing. This is a formula from geometry that tells us the volume of a cone with radius r and height h. We're asked to solve for r. So again, I think I'm going to start by clearing fractions. In this case, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by 3. If I do that, I get 3v equals pi r squared h. Now I want to isolate r squared so that I can eventually solve for r. Looking at my equation now, I can see I need to get rid of this constant pi and this variable h. I can do that all in one step if I divide both sides of the equation by pi h. So let's do that. If I divide 3v by pi h and pi r squared h by pi h, I'm left with 3v over pi h equals r squared. Again, I'm up to a point where I can use the square root principle. The square root principle tells me that r equals plus or minus the square root of 3v over pi h. Again, if I were doing an application with this formula, I would only choose the positive square root because r is representing a radius. We were just asked to solve for I, r, so we're done. Now let's solve s equals 1 half a t squared plus v t for t. In this case, s is the distance of an object from some established point t seconds after it was pushed down a linear track with an initial velocity v, where a is the object's acceleration. Now we're asked to solve for t. This equation looks quite a bit different from the last two that I've looked at. What I am noticing, though, is I still have a quadratic equation. s equals 1 half a t squared plus v t. This equation is quadratic in t. And there are two occurrences of the variable t that I'm trying to solve for. The square root principle isn't going to work here. What are other ways we talked about solving quadratic equations? Well, we had solving by factoring and applying the zero product principle, and we had the quadratic formula. Either of those methods requires us to get zero on one side of the equal sign. I can do that most easily by subtracting s from both sides of this equation. If I do that, I have zero equals 1 half a t squared plus v t minus s. Now I have no idea how to factor this, but I know I can always apply the quadratic formula. In the quadratic formula, I have to think about the values of a, b, and c. They're a little bit confusing here since we're working with all kinds of variables in our formula. Well, a is always the coefficient of the squared term. The coefficient of the squared term in this case is 1 half times capital A. In algebra, it makes a difference whether you use lowercase or uppercase letters. B is always the coefficient of the linear term. In this case, the coefficient of T is V. So B equals V. And then C is our constant. In this case, the opposite of S, the term that doesn't involve T at all. So C is the opposite of s. So knowing that, let's apply the quadratic formula. So we're solving for t. And according to the quadratic formula, we take the opposite of b, which we've already noticed is v. So the opposite of v, plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's v squared, minus 4 times a, which is 1 half 
capital A, times C, which is the opposite of S. All of this over 2 times A, which is 2 times 1 half of capital A. And we can simplify this a little bit. So we still have the opposite of V, plus or minus, let's simplify our radicand. V squared, and this is going to be plus, half of 4 is 2, so 2 A S. In the denominator, I have 2 times 1 half, which is 1, so I just have 1 A, which I can write as A. So this is our simplified form, and we get two values for T. Here's another problem. We're told that the number of diagonals D in a regular polygon that has N sides is given by this formula. How many diagonals does a hexagon have? Well, let's make sure we know what a diagonal is and what a hexagon is. A diagonal is a line segment connecting non-adjacent vertices of a polygon. And a hexagon is a six-sided polygon. So this picture actually contains a hexagon. What would a diagonal of this hexagon look like? Well, this is one of the possible diagonals of this hexagon. It's connecting to non-adjacent vertices. So let's uh, use our formula to find out how many diagonals a hexagon has. So we've just said a hexagon has six sides. So if n equals 6, then d equals 6 squared minus 3 times 6 all over 2. This is 36 minus 18 all over 2, which is 18 divided by 2, which is 9. So according to this formula, A hexagon has nine diagonals. Let's go ahead and verify that. So here's a hexagon. I'm going to start by looking at this vertex to the left. How many diagonals can I draw off of this vertex? Well, there's one, two, three. Moving up to this vertex, how many diagonals can I draw for this vertex? Well, another three. That takes us up to six diagonals. Moving to this vertex, one of the diagonals is already drawn, but I can draw two more. This brings us up to eight diagonals. Moving to the vertex on the far right, two of the diagonals are already drawn off of this vertex. I can draw one more, bringing our total up to nine. And notice that the bottom two vertices already have the three diagonals drawn off of them. So as our formula predicted, a hexagon does have nine diagonals. Here's another question with this formula. According to the formula, is there a polygon with no diagonals? Well, D is representing the number of diagonals, so we're looking at the case where D equals zero. So if D equals zero, then we have 0 equals n squared minus 3n divided by 2. I want to give myself a little bit of space to solve this equation. So we put in 0 for d. And to solve this equation, I'm going to start by clearing the fractions. So I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation by 2. 2 times 0 is still 0, so I have 0 equals when I multiply the right-hand side of the equation by 2, I clear the fraction. So 0 equals n squared minus 3n. Notice that I can factor the right-hand side of this equation. I can pull out a common factor of n. So I have 0 equals n times the quantity n minus 3. So the zero product principle tells me that n either equals 0 or n equals 3. Well, let's remember what n represents. n is the number of sides in our regular polygon. If n is 0, the polygon has 0 sides, which means all we have is a point or the vertex. There isn't a polygon. So that solution doesn't make any sense. n equals 3, well, that would mean we would have a triangle. So this is telling us that a triangle has no diagonals. Does that make sense? Well, if I tried to draw a diagonal in this triangle, let's start with this bottom left vertex, and I try to connect to a vertex, well, these are adjacent vertices. I actually get a side of the triangle, not a diagonal. If I move up to this vertex, 
I already know if I go this direction, I get a side of the triangle. If I go this direction, I get another side, not a diagonal. Same thing if I start here, I get the third side of this triangle. There are no diagonals. There's no way to connect non-adjacent vertices. So a triangle has no diagonals. Let's look at another application. Over the course of the 20th century, the population of the city of Detroit rose from around 300,000 to a little less than 2 million before tragically falling back below 1 million. The population of Detroit in thousands of people t years after 1940 can roughly be modeled by this formula. Answer the following questions based upon this model. Well, let's note a couple of things about this model before moving on to the questions. One thing that's important about this model is to remember that the population is measured in thousands of people. The other thing to note is that this model starts the year 1940, and T represents the number of years after 1940. According to the model, what was the population of Detroit in 1950? Well, since T represents the number of years since 1940, we're interested in when T equals 10. 10 years after 1940 would be 1950. So if t equals 10, then well, we need our model. According to our model, p is going to equal negative 0.46 times 10 squared plus 14.11 times 10 plus 1,755. Now I'm going to pull out a calculator and do this calculation. So I want to take negative 0.46 and multiply that by 10 squared, add 14.11 times 10, and add 1,755. This gives me about 1,850. So what is this telling me? Well, the other important thing I said we needed to remember about this model is that population is measured in thousands of people. So if P is 1,850, we're talking about 1,850,000 ,000 people, which is actually 1,850,000. So according to this model, the population of Detroit in 1950 was about 1,850,000. According to the model, in what year did the population fall below 1 million? We're talking about population now, so we're talking about p-values. And the p-values are measured in thousands of people. So if we're looking at 1 million, then p would need to be 1,000 because 1,000 thousand is a million. So if P equals 1,000, what does our model tell us? Well, let's pull out our model. Then we would have 1,000 equals negative 0.46 T squared plus 14.11 times T plus 1,755. I have a quadratic equation that I need to solve for T. So the first thing I'm going to do here is make sure I get 0 on one side of the equal sign. I can do that most easily by subtracting 1,000 from both sides of the equation. So 0 equals negative 0.46 t squared plus 14.11 t. And if I subtract 1,000 from 1,755, I have 755. Now I have no idea how that factors, and I suspect that it doesn't, so I'm going to go right to the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula tells me that t equals the opposite of b, that's the opposite of 14.11, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's 14.11 squared, minus 4 times a, which is negative 0.46, times c, 
which is 755. All over 2 times a, so that's 2 times negative 0.46. I think I'm going to find out what the radicand is, what my discriminant in this case is. So I'm going to pull out the calculator. So I have 14.11 squared minus 4 times negative 0.46 times 755. That's about 1588.2921. Now I don't think that's a perfect square, but I'd better check just to make sure. So taking the square root, I don't get an integer back. So I'm needing to work with this number, which I'm suspecting is an approximation. I think I'm going to go ahead and store this in the calculator's memory. So I need to first clear the memory on this calculator. So I'm going to calculate that radicand one more time and store it into the memory. So 14.11 squared minus 4 times negative 0.46 times 755. That's the number we got before. I want to store that in memory. Now I'm going to calculate the two different values of t using the radicand that I've stored in memory. So the first value of t, in the numerator, I'm going to put that in parentheses, I have negative 14.11 plus the radicand we have stored in memory, the square root of that, that ends the numerator, and we're going to divide that by, I'm also going to put that denominator in parentheses because I'm multiplying 2 times negative 0.46. And I get about negative 27.98. But I get a second value of t if I subtract that radical. So I already have my radicand stored in memory. So I can go ahead and start my next calculation. So I'm going to put the numerator in parentheses, 14.11, I'm taking the opposite of that, and then I'm going to subtract the square root of the number I have stored in memory. That ends the numerator, and I want to divide that by 2 times negative 0.46 and I get about 58.66. So let's think about what we have here. Two different values of t. The first value of t I calculated, about negative 27.98, doesn't make any sense in this model. One thing we were going to remember about this model is that we're measuring t as the number of years since 1940. So the, a negative value means that we're talking about a year before 1940. So the only value that makes any sense for this model is um, 58.66, that approximation. So 58.66 means we're talking about 58.66 years after 1940. That would be towards the end of 1998. So according to this model, The population of Detroit fell below 1 million at the end of 1998. One more question with this model. According to the model, what was the maximum population Detroit reached? Well, let's look at our model for a second. Our model is a quadratic equation. If I graphed this model, I would get a parabola, and I know the parabola is going to open downwards because my leading coefficient, my value of a, is negative. So if I have a downward opening parabola, the vertex is going to give me the highest point on the parabola, and the second coordinate of that vertex is going to correspond to the maximum population. So let's go ahead and find out the vertex. So the t-coordinate of the vertex
So T equals the opposite of B over 2A. In this case, that's the opposite of 14.11 over 2 times negative 0.46. Definitely going to pull out my calculator for this. So we have the opposite of 14.11, and we're dividing by, I'm going to put this denominator in parentheses, 2 times negative 0.46 and we get about 15.34. I want to know what the maximum population Detroit reached was. What I found so far is just my T coordinate of the vertex. T tells me about the amount of time in years since 1940. P tells me about the population. So I need to use my formula to calculate the P value. And I don't want to cause more rounding errors, so I don't want to use this rounded value of t to compute the value of p, which will in turn tell me about the population. So what I'm going to do is use the calculator's memory again to store the t-coordinate of the vertex. So if t equals our exact value, negative 14.11 over 2 times negative 0.46, Then P, this I'm going to pull out the calculator for. So let's put this in um, memory. I need to clear out the memory first. I'm going to take the opposite of 14.11 and divide that by the quantity 2 times negative 0.46. That's the value we got before. So I want to store this in memory. Now using my formula for P, P is going to be negative 0.46 times the square of that number I have stored in memory. So I'll recall that number from memory and square it plus 14.11 times that number I have stored in memory plus 1,755. And I get about 1,863. We have to remember, though, that P is measured in thousands of people. So 1,863,000 is about 1,863,000. So according to the model, the maximum population Detroit reached was about 1,863,000. Let's look at another application. A large commercial cattle ranch, Pickled Cow Corporation, PCC for short, is analyzing the total market weight per acre for its cattle. An internal report from PCC indicates that the ranch currently allows 20 steers per acre of grazing, and an average steer weighs 2,000 pounds at market. A memo from the Agricultural Department indicates that the average market weight per steer will be reduced by 50 pounds for each additional steer added per acre of grazing land. Develop a formula describing the total market weight in pounds for PCC's cattle, W, in terms of the number of steers over 20 per acre of grazing, n. Find the number of steers per acre of grazing that will maximize the total market weight per acre. So the first thing we need to do is find out a formula. So let's complete table one to establish a pattern between the number of steer and the total market weight in pounds per acre. So in table one, we know that currently there are 20 steers per acre of grazing, and we were told that the average steer weight was 2,000 pounds. Here we have a column for total market weight. Where does this value 40,000 come from? Well, total market weight equals the number of steer times the average steer weight. In this case, 20 times 2,000 is indeed 40,000. In this table, I'm going to not simplify my calculations because I'm looking for a pattern. So let's move on to if there were 21 steers per acre of grazing. 
Well, we were told that's going to reduce the average steer weight by 50 pounds. So that's going to be 2,000 minus 50. And when we multiply these two quantities together, the number of steers per acre of grazing by the average steer weight, we have 21 times the quantity 2,000 minus 50. Again, I can simplify that, but I don't want to. I'm looking for a pattern. What if there are 22 steers per acre of grazing? Well, then we're going to have to subtract 100 pounds, 2 times 50 pounds. Multiplying these two quantities together, we get 22 times the quantity 2,000 minus 2 times 50. If there were 23 steers per acre of grazing, the average steer weight would be 2,000 pounds minus 3 times 50 pounds. We've added 3 over that initial 20 steers per acre. Multiplying these two values together, we have 23 times the quantity 2,000 minus 3 times 50. So let's try to generalize. What if there were 20 plus n? Remember, n's representing the number of steer over 20 per acre of grazing. Well, then what's the average steer weight in pounds going to be? Before we try to come up with our formula, I want to rewrite the table a little bit. Notice that I have 20 plus n, but in the first column above, I've got 21, 22, 23. I don't have these in the form 20 plus a number. So I'm going to rewrite 21 as 20 plus 1 and change that corresponding total market weight to indicate the 20 plus 1. Same thing with 22 and with 23. Now hopefully we see a pattern emerging here. In our formula for the average steer weight, we know that every time we add one steer, we're going to have to subtract 50 pounds. So in this case, we would have 2,000 minus n times 50. We can write that a little bit simpler as 2,000 minus 50n. Then when we multiply these two quantities together to get the total market weight per acre, that's 20 plus n times the quantity 2,000 minus 50n. Here's our formula. W, then, is going to equal 20 plus n times the quantity 2,000 minus 50n. Now, we were asked to find the number of steers per acre of grazing that will maximize the total market weight per acre and the maximum weight. First thing I think I'm going to do is expand the right-hand side of this formula. So W is going to equal 20 times 2,000, that's 40,000, minus 1,000n plus 2,000n minus 50n squared. Simplifying, we have w equals 40,000 plus 1,000n minus 50n squared. Notice that I have a quadratic equation here. And notice that a, the coefficient of n squared, is negative 50. So if I graphed the model, I would have a parabola opening downwards, and the vertex would be the highest point on the parabola, which is good because we're trying to maximize the total market weight. So let's go ahead and find the vertex of this parabola. So the n coordinate. of the vertex is going to be n equals the opposite of b over 2a. And in my expanded form, I can see that b is 1,000. So this is the opposite of 1,000 over 2 times. Again, in my expanded form, I saw that a was negative 50. So we have negative 1,000 divided by negative 100, which is 10. So the n coordinate of the vertex is 10. What about the w coordinate? Because I'm also interested in the maximum weight. So going back to the original form of the formula that we found, now that we know that the n coordinate of the vertex is 10, we still need to find w because we are asked about the maximum total market weight. So if n equals 10, then w equals 20 plus 10 times 2,000 minus 50 times 10. That's 30 times 2,000 minus 500 is 1,500. And 30 times 1,500 is 45,000. So what is this telling us? Well, remember n was the number of steers above 20. 
So 20 plus 10 is 30. So if we have 30 steers per acre of grazing, the maximum total market weight is 45,000 pounds. Let's write our conclusion. The number of steer per acre of grazing that maximizes the total market weight is 30. And the maximum total market weight is 45,000 pounds. That ends my part of the lesson. I'm going to turn this over to Steve now, who's going to talk about a completely different topic, that is functions.